welcome to the first video lecture for AskAMathematician.com. I'm the mathematician and today we're going to be talking about whether 1 plus 1 equals 2 is a true statement. So I would imagine that everyone watching this believes 1 plus 1 equals 2 is really true, but have you ever thought about how we know that and whether we can know that? And so to start this discussion off, I'm going to talk about the history of math, where math came from. And, because, and by talking about where math came from, I'm going to try and give us some idea of, of how we justify math. So, of course, math began many, many thousands of years ago, and we can't know for sure how it was developed. Uh, but that being said, we can come up with a very plausible explanation for the way it worked out. So, first, uh, almost certainly the first mathematics of any kind was numbers that are used as adjectives to describe quantities of things. So, for example, you might say there are three wolves over there or I have three children. And like most adjectives, they can be applied to all different kinds of objects. It's not restricted to only a certain class of objects. Um, but this isn't really doing math. This is just the first mathematical idea. So how do we go from there to actually the beginning of math? Well, it's pretty clear that um, if you keep quantifying things enough, you start to realize that there are patterns the way things get quantified. In particular, if you group objects together, there are predictable patterns. So if I have three children, and you have two children, and then our children all go into a cave together, there will be five children. And that rule will apply not just for children, but for absolutely any kind of entity whatsoever that gets grouped. So we can then start talking about, if, if the grouping is, always occurs in always the same way for any kind of object, we can forget for a moment that we're quantifying particular objects and just talk about the properties of the numbers themselves, um, because it's independent of the objects. And so then, we take this philosophical leap where we go from thinking of numbers as adjectives to thinking of numbers as nouns and start asking questions about numbers themselves. So for example, we can say, I have the number two and I have the number three, and we can introduce this operation called addition that acts on these two numbers and, and behaves the same way that grouping objects in the real world works. So two plus three equals five. But it's worth asking the question, can we use the empirical world and the fact that grouping two children plus three children gives you five children, can that actually be used to justify the equation two plus three equals five? Um, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. We can't conclude that two plus three equals five is a true statement simply because grouping two children with three children gives you five children. Why is that? Well, in part because we've designed addition and two and three to model that situation. That's the reason we developed it. So we simply modeled what we saw so to say that we justify uh, addition using that real-world situation is getting things backwards. We actually model that real-world situation by introducing addition. Addition has specific properties that are relevant to that situation. And in particular, we can come up with plenty of situations where uh, addition does not form a good model. For example, let's say two kids go in a cave and then three kids go in a cave. But while they're in the cave, uh, one of the kids catches on fire and burns up. Well, then no longer can we say that, that addition is a good model for that situation because two went in and three went in, but now we have four kids. So clearly, some situations addition models and some, some it doesn't. Uh, another example, let's say we have gelatinous balls and we put uh, three gelatinous balls in a bag and then we put two gelatinous balls in a bag, but because they're so gelatinous, they all sort of merge into one ball. They get stuck together. And in the end, we're left with actually one ball in the bag. Well, clearly, again, addition is not modeling this situation. So just in the same way that we can't say that um, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is true because combining children in a cave make, gives you two, two children, we also can't say that addition is false because, just simply because sometimes if you put gelatinous balls in a bag, you add one and add another, you only get one out. That doesn't mean that 1 plus 1 equals 1, clearly. Addition is specifically designed to model some situations and not others. Um, but in fact, uh, with, with, the, with this modeling property, you might introduce a different operation that works for gelatinous balls. So for example, let's say um, we want to introduce a new operation. We'll call it plus with a circle around it. And we might say that 1 plus 1 equals 1. Uh, this models a situation of putting two gelatinous balls in a bag, and then they merge into one ball. And then so we only have one ball in the bag afterwards. And this is not addition. It's another operation. Um, and this operation satisfies the property that you know, we could add another one on there, so we added three gelatinous balls in the bag, and we still only have one. So it's a totally different kind of operation. So the point being, there's nothing that 
that special about addition, except that it actually models real-world situations very, very well. And, and many situations can be modeled uh, using plus, and you can make predictions about what's going to happen. Okay, so that's a little bit about the history, but then how do we go from that to the pure math theory that we have today? I mean, we have all kinds of theorems about, about mathematical objects. Well, the pure math arises pretty naturally as soon as you start thinking of numbers as nouns rather than adjectives. You think of a number as an object in and of itself. And then you, start, you can start asking questions about numbers, and you can start defining groups of numbers. You can say, let's define this thing called a prime number. Um, and then we can ask questions. Are, prime number, are there an infinite number of prime numbers or only a finite number? Um, is seven prime? Is six prime? So very quickly, you start getting pure math, which is questions about math rather than relating math to the real world, which is applied math. Um, and then going from, from pure math, we, we find that, like, that you know, for thousands of years, all we, we, oh, so for thousands of years, all we had was really just applied math, applying math through situations. And then we, this pure math theory developed on top of it. Finally, mathematicians looked at all this work they'd done, all these beautiful theorems they'd proven, and all these mathematical objects they'd introduced, and they said to themselves, can we actually justify this in some fundamental way? Um, and that justification could come in many flavors, but one such justification um, they, they, they ask themselves, can we come up with a basic set of statements, a small number of statements, such that if you assume those statements are true, all the rest of math can be derived from them, and therefore will be true by the assumption that the first statements are true. And these, these fundamental statements are known as axioms, and the most popular way to do this today is what's known as ZFC, zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice. The C stands for choice. And there are eight basic axioms, uh, so what are these axioms? What do they look like? Well, one example would be, um, so, so I, should, I should mention, these axioms uh, are talking about things called sets. So what is a set? It's just a collection of objects, of mathematical objects. So for example, we might say we have one set that contains one, two, and three, and that's how we would write it. So that's an example of a set. But of course it doesn't have to contain numbers. We could also just have a set containing A and B, so that's a different set. And when we talk about these eight basic axioms, um, all of them are referring to sets. Okay, so what, is, what are some examples of axioms? First axiom is that if two sets have exactly the same elements, then they're the same set. That seems such an obvious thing that we feel like it doesn't even need justification, but that's one of our axioms. Another axiom is that if we have two sets, one we'll call x, and another set we call y, then, we can, then the axiom says we can always construct a new set that contains x and y. So therefore, you can see we have sets of sets. So this set contains two sets, and so forth. Um, and now I'm going to go on a little bit of a dig digression. And I'm going to say, what if there were a ninth axiom? Um, what would that mean? And um, is there any way we can make sense of that? And then I'm going to tie this into talking about how do we justify axioms. So mathematical digression now, where I'm going to introduce some mathematical objects, and then I'm going to talk about um, uh, what a ninth axiom might be. So the objects I'm going to introduce are, I'm going to start with the real numbers. So the real numbers is a set of essentially all the numbers you've, you've ever heard of, excluding imaginary complex numbers. So, so what are real numbers? Examples are pi, um, 3.2, 7 fourths, negative 6, 0, and so forth. They're just all the numbers. Um, and this is uh, a set which is bigger in some sense than the set of rational numbers, because every rational number is a real number. And so what are the rational numbers? The rational numbers are simply ratios of integers. So for example, uh, 3 halves is a ratio of integers, so that's a rational number. And 7.2, it turns out, can be written as a ratio of integers, so that's a rational number. And uh, 6 is a, is, a, is a ratio of numbers, because it's 6 divided by 1. And you can get negative numbers too, like negative uh, 4.9 is, is another rational number. And as you see, every rational number is a real number. So the rationals are, uh, we say, are actually a subset of the reals. Um, we can introduce another set, which is the integers. And the integers are all whole numbers, both negative and positive. So you have negative 6, and 0, and 4, etc. And these are clearly a subset of the rationals, because each of these can be written as a ratio of two integers. Like 6, negative 6 is the ratio of negative 6 and 1. Uh, and then we have, finally, the positive integers. And these are a subset of the integers, because these are just the whole numbers that are excluded.